Hey there, Nick Juntakis here. In this video, we're going to go over a few advantages of using Docker Compose v2 as well as Docker Compose profiles. Profiles are a great way to dry out your Docker Compose YAML file so that you can run different services in different environments. You may have used something like the Docker Compose override file pattern, which I've done videos about in the past. In my opinion though, Docker Compose profiles are just a much better version of that. They're more flexible, faster, and they work with depends on a little bit nicer. So throughout this video, we're going to go over how to use profiles and also set them up. But uh, before that, I just wanted to quickly mention here that Docker Compose has a blog post around announcing Docker Compose general availability. Now, I feel like I'm a little bit late to the show here. They actually released this back in April 2022. But in my opinion, there were a couple of bugs with Docker Compose v2 where I was not comfortable using it in production. But I would say as of maybe a month ago, I'm going to say like August 2022, July, you know, in that region there, uh, I found Docker, Docker Compose v2 to be quite stable. I've moved all of my production workloads over to using it, and I am really happy. And uh, some advantages there are, yeah, you can just start and stop com containers a little bit faster. You don't need a Python environment anymore to install Docker Compose v2 because now it's just a system package that you can install. For example, if you run a Debian or Ubuntu-based system on Linux there, and you know you have a server somewhere, you can just apt install Docker Compose plugin. It's an app package that you can install just like Docker CE. And if you're running Docker Desktop and Mac OS, Windows or Linux, then enabling Docker Compose v2, it's just a matter of enabling a checkbox in your settings. So before I get ahead of myself here, somewhere in this blog post, Docker has a little timeline of how they're gonna release Docker Compose v2. So right now it's available in Docker Desktop. You just need to opt into using it, at least at the time of making this video, which is mid-September 22. So basically, yeah, in April 2022, if you're running Docker Desktop, Desktop, you just need to go into their settings here. I'm actually not running Docker Desktop, so I can't show you directly here, but this screenshot in the blog post just says, you know, go to the general preferences or settings, and you can just enable the checkbox here that says use Docker Compose v2. You know, maybe this help text or wording is a little bit different in the future, but you know, that's basically how you install it there. And then starting in, if I can find that uh, yeah, over here, starting in October 22, so maybe if you're watching this video a month after I recorded or later, then that Docker Compose v2 is going to be enabled by default. So the idea here is, yeah, you can just uh, opt out of using Docker Compose v2 instead of it being opt-in. So by default, you'll just get it in October 22, again, assuming Docker sticks to their schedule. And, you know, speaking of schedules, then we have in April 2023, then it's just not going to be possible to opt out of using Docker Compose v2, at least not through the Docker desktop UI. Kind of sounds like Docker Compose v1 is no longer going to be maintained potentially, and uh, you'll want to be using Docker Compose v2. So, yeah, just going back to what I mentioned before, uh, containers do start a little bit uh, faster and stop a little bit faster with Docker Compose v2. So this example application here, Docker Flask example, it is up and available on GitHub over here. So feel free to check it out if you want to play around with it. Everything has been updated to use Docker Compose v2 as well as profiles, which again, as a reminder, we're going to see that very soon in the video. Now, if you prefer using something like Django or Rails or Phoenix or Node, I do have example applications for those as well. So feel free to just replace Flask with Rails or you know whatever framework you, uh, of choice that at least I support there if you want to go and check it out there. They're all been updated to use Compose and or Compose v2 and profiles. So yeah. Going back over here, you know, you can just check to make sure that you have Docker Compose v2 enabled. You can just run Docker Compose version there. And uh, yeah, it's just installed as a uh, Docker plugin. So if you were to install Docker Compose v2 on native Linux, by the way, I've been talking a little bit about Docker Desktop, but and uh, I actually do have an Ansible role to install that. If you happen to be running Docker on a server, I'll leave a link to that one in the description if you want to check it out. I don't think I've done any specific videos about that one. But yeah. Uh, since Docker Compose v2 is just a plugin for Docker, you know, it's written in Go, you don't need a Python environment to be running Docker Compose because the first one, you know, Docker Compose v1, that is a Python package. So typically, you know, you would pip install that, but that means you need to set up a Python environment, maybe a virtual environment on a server just so you don't collaborate with system dependencies. Or, you know, maybe you just curl down the Docker Compose v1 binary, which is really still running Python under the hood, but it just happens to use PyInstaller to bundle up the Python environment for you. Um, it's actually a little bit more uh, less efficient to run that one because then it has to unpack the Pi Installer stuff. Like it basically introduces like two or 300 milliseconds of latency. I've actually done a blog post about that one in the past. I'll leave a link to it in the description. Not important. Why? Because we're going to be using Docker Compose v2. Uh, but yeah, you can just make sure that uh, it's available with this version command. Notice I'm using the space again instead of uh, uh, the hyphen. So I can just run a Docker Compose up here and that's going to up this project like normal. Um, but it's actually kind of funny because why no services are selected? Uh, because right before this video, I commented something out here and uh, I actually forgot to uncomment it, but it's a good segue into how these profiles may work. So let me just open up the compose file here and we'll start with that before we go to that environment file. But um, so if you've you know played around with some of my projects in the past, then this should look 
you know, reasonably familiar, but you know, this, in case you haven't, this application is, you know, a fairly standard web stack, right? We have Postgres running, we have Redis, we have uh, a web application server in Python in this case, I'm using Gunicorn, and we have a worker, and in this case is using Celery. If you're a Rails developer, that's uh, more familiar to Psychic. And uh, for the web thing, you might be running Puma if you're running a Rails app instead. But pretty standard, right? Database, cache, web, and worker. And all of these services now, they have a new property that I put here called profiles. And you know, this is just uh, the profiles feature of Docker Compose. And this takes a list here and you can name these profiles whatever you want. But uh, one thing that I've started to do here is I just name these profiles based on the services, uh, you know, based on the actual service name. So for Postgres here, I have this profile named Postgres. For Redis, I have this one named Redis. For web, I have it named web. For worker, I have it named worker. And JavaScript and CSS here, I forgot to mention this before, you know, this is running uh, an ES build watcher in development as well as the Tailwind watcher. And while I don't have the profiles defined here exactly uh, on each service, if I jump back up to the top of the file here, and I cover this pattern in my Docker con talk from 2021, you know, you can basically use Docker compose properties and you know, those aliases and anchors property of YAML here. So you can define custom properties. And you can see here that the profile for assets, this applies to both the JS and CSS services that we looked at before, because both of these are using all the properties here. It's basically, you know, almost like a function call where you can get, you know, the benefits of having all these defined here. I went into details about that in my Docker Compose uh, or Docker Con talk from uh, last year. But that's how I have all these profiles set up here. You can do the same thing. You know, there's nothing fancy about this one. And uh, when you run a Docker Compose up, you have a couple of options here. So when I run Docker Compose up now, then Docker Compose is actually not finding any services to run here. You can see no services selected. Why? Because uh, if you have services defined with no profiles property, then that's just standard Docker Compose behavior. And when you run a Docker Compose up, it would run them. But since we have profiles defined on these services, then we need to explicitly tell Docker Compose which profiles to run. And in that case, you can either, one, there's a, a profile flag that you can run. Notice it's part of Docker Compose, not the actual up command. And then you can do something like, you know, web and worker and assets and Postgres and Redis and all that stuff. And you could totally do that, that's fine, it's going to work. But what I prefer doing is, if I go to the env file here, Docker Compose is already set up here to support the idea of setting these profiles as environment variables. So I just save this file now and we have this new exported Compose, profi uh, compose Profiles where now we just say I wanna use the profile Postgres, Redis, Assets, Web, and Worker. And if we go back to here and I run a Docker Compose up, then Docker Compose would be like, okay, cool, you wanna use those profiles? Let's run them all. And uh, we can see we just upped all the projects here. And you know, since we're using Docker Compose V2, we kind of get some nice output here. We can see all those containers were created. And if I were to go to the site here, localhost 48,000, that's where it's running. Then we have our Flask application running here or whatever framework uh, you decide to be running or web application. And then you know, I can just control C that and they're all going to stop. I also noticed that Docker Compose V2 does stop containers a little bit faster than Docker Compose V1. Now, in my case too, I've also configured this one property here in this Compose YAML file, uh, which is the stop grace period. So on all my applications here, I have a three second grace period for the application to stop. So this is not specific to Docker Compose V2, but the default value for this one is 10. So basically it's going to configure Docker Compose to wait up to 10 seconds for your process or whatever you're running in your container to stop gracefully. You know, it's gonna send it a sig term, but if it surpasses this timeout, then it's going to send a sig kill, which is going to immediately kill your process on the spot. You can see here, even for assets that I have that set to zero, because why I don't really care if these things stop, uh, you know, abruptly with a sig kill because they're just running in development, they're watchers. There's no reason to wait for them. And I notice that sometimes they take quite a long time to uh, stop by themselves. But uh, for the stop period time here, three seconds, I found that to be a pretty good value. Um, just running that generally for most web applications. Again, you know, you can start tweaking that if you want. Like for example, uh, on the worker here, if you want to hire time, because maybe you just want to wait until some uh, work is finished before killing off the container, you can always just pop that property over here and override that with a higher value. You know, if you're using this pattern here, then uh, whatever you had to find here is going to win. But I don't want to get too, too sidetracked into that. But in any case though, like even all things are equal, if you ran Docker Compose V1 versus V2 and you started doing stopping and start, and you began doing starting and stopping, you'll notice that it is a little bit faster using Docker Compose V2. That's uh, really nice in my opinion. And yes, going back to this ENV file here that we were looking at before, it is really, really, really nice because let's say that uh, now you're deploying your application to production, right? And you can reuse the same exact Docker Compose YAML file, but on your production server, you can just have uh, a different ENV or environment variable 
that uh, exports a different set of services that you want to run. You know, let's say that we just want to run Postgres, Redis, Web, and Worker. Let's not start up the assets. So all I did there was just export this new environment variable. If I run, were to run a Docker Compose up here, you can see the assets containers are no longer being started, right? We just have uh, Postgres, Redis, Web, and Worker. Whereas up here before, we also had CSS and JavaScript. So this is great because now, you know, I'm not demonstrating it here, but if I were to run this application in production mode, those assets are going to be copied into the image. So we don't need to run something like the Tailwind Watcher or the ES Build Watcher. And this is like the killer feature of Docker Compose V2 versus V1. So V1 supports profiles to some degree, but they're a little bit more limited. So for example, you know, let's say that you want to run your web application in production on a single server using Docker Compose. I do this all the time. I think it's a great pattern. You know, some, pe some people are like, well, it's not web scale, like whatever. I'm not going to get into that discussion in this video. It actually works uh, quite well. But let's say though, you know, just to be a little bit more resilient to some failure, you decide that you want to use your hosting provider's managed version of Postgres or maybe Redis. So in production, let's say that maybe you just want to run the web and worker. And if we do a Docker Compose up here, I can just run that again, and we can see that uh, the web and worker were created. The database did not get created. Now, this application depends on Redis running here. The background worker, Celery, just uses Redis as a back end. So Celery is going to be like, well, you know, kind of need to uh, connect to Redis here. Can, you know, Redis isn't available. That's because I'm running this on my dev box. But imagine I was running this on DigitalOcean using their managed uh, Redis or managed Postgres, right? Uh, we can totally do that. And that is going to work awesomely. Now, the really cool thing about Docker Compose v2 versus v1 is if we go to this compose.yaml file, I actually do have a depends on set to Postgres and Redis for the app here. And, and the app is just the web and the worker. You can see down here that I'm just reusing those properties for both. But Docker Compose v1, if you have something like depends on Postgres and Redis and these services aren't available, then this command to run Docker Compose up is just not going to work. It's going to be like, well, you know, you kind of want to launch Postgres and Redis, but those container or services aren't available. Like, sorry, I'm just not going to run. So it makes using this pattern of being able to run different containers in different environments. You know, I don't want to say essentially useless because that's kind of demeaning to, you know, all the work that's been put into Docker and Docker Compose, but like kind of sort of is, right? Because it's like, it's a very, very, very common pattern to use a managed Postgres and Redis. But yeah, I've done some real hacky things uh, in the past to make this work without Docker Compose v2. Like, you know, I, part of my deploy process, what I would end up doing is I would just use sed to just run a find and replace basically in this file and like comment out the depends on as just like a pre-deploy hook before I run a Docker Compose up. Totally works, but it's like, eh, you sleep at night and you're just like, man, I wish there was a better way. And uh, Docker Compose v2 and profiles just seamlessly work like that. And uh, that is absolutely great because that is going to make things a lot easier just uh, to make everything work. So let me put that back to where it was before. And we can get, again, just see like, let's say, you know, you want to run everything, then uh, yeah, you can just do a Docker Compose up. And, uh, you know, I, I did mention this a little bit before, but instead of using the environment variable, you can put it on the command line. But uh, just in case that uh, you may have forgotten that, or I forgot to say that because I did record the intro to this video a couple of times until I was happy with it. You know, this profile command that you can run, you know, you can do web worker or comma separated, et cetera. You know, just as a reminder, it is part of the Docker compose command. It is not part of the up command, meaning that it is going to work uh, regardless of whether you're running up or down or config or, you know, anything like that. For example, you know, if I run the config command here and we just put in web here, then that should just give me back a Docker compose set up here just for the web. And uh, that actually didn't work at all. Kind of interesting. Let me rerun that command, make sure I had things set up. You know, maybe the uh, maybe the env file is taking precedence over that. So let me just rerun this again and, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, there we go. So the env file just happened to win there. So it does work as totally expected here. There's a web service, there's the config for it, and uh, everything is good to go here. You can see there is asset stuff down here, but you know, this is not technically a defined service. That's kind of just like something that you could use, but this service uh, just happens not to use it here. And uh, also one thing before I wrap this one up, uh, just, you know, potential use cases for production where this is quite nice. Let's say, you know, talking back to our production environment setup, uh, let's let's go one step further and say that, you know, okay, I'm going to be running managed Postgres and Redis. But in fact, what I want to do is run two completely separate servers. Maybe server A is going to run the web. 
uh, service and server two or B or whatever is going to run the worker. So you can imagine just uh, on server A with the web, you would just export compose profiles here with just web. And then on server B, you would export compose profiles worker. And now suddenly you've just distributed your application on two different servers. Now, you know, the web application is not load balanced or anything like that. But, you know, if you're running um, a kind of a busy application where you know your background worker is going to be doing lots of things and you are noticing that uh, on a single server, you're, you know, either memory bound or CPU bound or something like that, you do have this option to very easily just run each one on a separate server, which is going to be uh, pretty good, giving you, you know, nice distribution of your services there to help reduce the load on your web application server. All in, uh, it is very nice. And again, just as a reminder, uh, this example application is all updated and ready to go here. That same exact Compose file that I was just looking at on video, it's available here. You know, it might be slightly different by the time that you watch this video because I constantly do update all of these example apps. And, you know, as I find and discover better patterns just from, you know, practical real world experience, then that all goes into these repos here. So with that said, let me know in the comments below if you are going to be using Docker Compose V2 or if you're already using it, are you already using uh, profiles? Are there some profile use cases that uh, I didn't cover here? Because really, you know, profiles, uh, you could do more advanced things here. You know, you can technically define more than one profile on a specific thing. But uh, yeah, in my day-to-day, -day, that stuff just has not come up here. I kind of like this pattern of just using uh, whatever profiles I need, and there we go. But uh, yeah, if you have some other ways to use it, please let us know in the comments. Also, if you like the video, please give a thumbs up because it really does help a lot. Thanks a lot for watching, and I will see you in the next video.